reading is found in two different places this morning, uh, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, and then 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And we are um, just uh, doing a, a short uh, summer series that uh, I am uh, I'm calling uh, How to Walk into Church. It's based on a book that we have uh, been uh, recommending as a uh, summer reading uh, called How to Walk into Church. And uh, our hope is that maybe as a, a local church that we'll begin to, to even build a, a sense of culture in the way we approach uh, our time of worship. Uh, we, um, the last couple of times we um, uh, were together, at least I was here um, doing this series, we looked at what the local church is and then why do we come here? Um, two seemingly obvious questions, but I think at times harder to answer when you're really pressed. So we thought through that together. Uh, this morning, what I want to think about is how do we actually prepare to come? And again, you, you might think, well, there's uh, some pretty obvious and straightforward answers to that, but it's good to remind ourselves uh, in, in a way maybe of a how-to uh, to prepare to come. So I picked two passages that I, I hope will, will gain, gave us, uh, give us some sort of, or at least better clarity uh, as to the answer to that question. The first is in Acts chapter 13, and I'm going to have to probably work a little bit harder at this one uh, to help us understand this better, but I hopefully you'll see where I'm going here. Acts 13, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll look at 1 Corinthians uh, 14, uh, 26 uh, in just a second. Acts 13 says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says, What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Amen. Amen. Well, this week I had um, one of those uh, interesting opportunities on Route 2 when I had three tires working correctly and one not. And... Um, uh, if you were on Route 2 sometime uh, on Monday around noon uh, at the Lost Nation exit, perhaps you have seen your pastor in all of his gear, uh, all of his pastoral dress, um, looking through uh, the manual on uh, the tire change on a car that I recently bought. And um, I wish I had the whole thing sort of memorized, but I didn't quite know where everything was in, in my car, so... I started in dutifully praying that nobody was texting and driving near the Lost Nation exit uh, on Route 2 at noon. And uh, as the cars were whizzing by, uh, I was able to figure out, for the most part, how to get the uh, bad tire off and, and, the, and the little donut tire on. Except uh, I got to this one place where all the lug nuts were the same except for one, which was almost like a little key. And in the manual, it didn't say it didn't say in the manual that there was one that was different. You know, one of these kids is doing his own thing. One of these kids ain't quite the same. And, and there was one lug nut that wasn't quite the same. And uh, so I kept looking and flipping and praying. And, and um, I'm standing there sweating, um, you know, late for a meeting. And I went back into this little baggie that had all the manuals. And, and hark, there was a little adapter at the bottom of the bag that perfectly fit that key. And I, I, I almost had like a little sort of charismatic moment uh, where I thought, surely that little adapter piece was not in there when I've looked in this bag. And then, Eureka, there it was. And uh, so uh, everything went, went okay after that point, and, and I made it to where I had to go. And, and all things, thanks to acceleration, are back to normal. Now, I will tell you that as I thought about that, I thought about the interrelationship between looking through the Bible in a series like this and the usage of a small book on the side that we recommended for summer reading called How to Walk into Church. The, the, Bible, the, the Bible, as we think about walking into church and preparing to worship, of course is going to be uh, the, the, the manual, if you like, by which 
we start to ask ourselves these difficult questions on our approach to, to worship in the local church. Of course. And that's why we're in it. Every now and again, though, you will come across maybe something where you need a little adapter piece. Something that helps you in the next step to further realize, you know, how to get from point A to point B. And I think what these little chapters have done in this book is given us that little adapter piece. What is the local church? Why do we come? How do we prepare? What do we do upon leaving? You know, these, these extra questions, I think, are helpful for us to start to think through what the Bible has to say. But the Bible is always going to be our reliable and inspired guide as to how we look at this. So I think the responses to the question is very, very straightforward. How do we prepare? Well, there's really two ways. At least there's a lot of things that we could get into, but I think there are two that seem to stick out to me from the scriptures that we just read. The first in Acts 13, we pray. The worship on Sunday morning really begins on Saturday night. So when we think about our approach to worship here, it must be bathed in consistent prayer. And as we think about praying not only for ourselves, the congregation, and for the world, like we do periodically inside this service, we think about that in terms of a, a better and more effective way to worship the Lord. And then secondly, from 1 Corinthians 14, 26, we're prepared to bring something. That's what Paul was getting at in Corinth. People were coming to the church kind of more for themselves. And his point wasn't, it's not about exhibition of your spiritual gifts. It's about edification of the people around you. The person who is speaking, really, the, it's not the only person speaking. is not the teacher up front. It's actually a responsibility for all of us to build one another up. So as we think of these things, my, my hope is that uh, we learn how to, number one, pray, and number two, bring. You know, church, at, at church, people are really good at bringing stuff, by the way. You go to a church, like you, some of our lunches and stuff, people bring great stuff. And it's almost like not even, yeah, I almost have to tell people not to bring things. You're like, we're going to get together for, what do I bring? I'm going to try to do the, bro the pasta, the marinara. No, no, no. Church is providing the lunch. You sure? Yes. People are great at this. Potlucks are like legendary in local churches. But what maybe what we are not as good at um, are thinking about how we might pray and think about bringing a word of encouragement or a lesson learned or an insight to build up the whole while we're here to worship and, and afterward. So Acts 13, 1 through 3, the first best way to prepare of entering local church worship is by praying. By praying, And what you're going to see then cascade off of the faithful worship, song, and prayer is the sending out and the increase of missionary activity outside of the local church. Admittedly, there's a lot of passages we can turn to to stress the importance of prayer. We could have gone to a lot of places. But I picked this one because I think what it, the elements that are brought together is one, worship in a local body, two, the different kinds of people that comprise that body, and three, what has transcended all of those people is the fact that they have come to Christ and they're now worshiping together in the strength of the Holy Spirit. They're learning how to pray together and then move out, be deployed into uh, an activity to make disciples of all nations. And so there's a, there's a purposeful reason why I chose this, and I hope that you see, at least through the establishment of a passage like this, how important it is to pray not only in the service while we're together, but to pray beforehand. Antioch, where this, um, uh, this passage is located, is a pretty cutting-edge place in the New Testament. There were a lot of prophets moving around Antioch. Uh, there was a buzz in the air about the movement of God. You see that in chapters 11 and 12. In chapter 11, verse 25, it tells us that uh, Barnabas, who was an early church leader, had gone looking for a radical convert named Saul, who I think a lot of Christians would have thought of as almost like an anti-Christian terrorist. And there Paul is, is teaching him doctrinal things inside the, the church in Antioch as now a follower of Christ. It says, so Barnabas in chapter 11, verse 25, went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and then he found him. He brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Isn't that interesting? Antioch 
has unlikely converts. And Antioch is like, a, in, a, in a way, kind of a new wave kind of place. They're not just called disciples now. They're called Christ ones, Christians. They're, going, they're, they're, they're undergoing uh, uh, a, a change in their designation. There's something afoot here. There's a movement. Paul's conversion would have been something, I think, on, in certain sides of, of the church, would have been radical, maybe even potentially scandalous, fearful. People may have thought, no, I don't believe it. I, I don't think God would do that. You, you saw how he was applauding Stephen stoning. Stephen was one of us. And now all of a sudden this guy has this, uh, this, this experience. I don't know. I'm not, sure if we, I'm not sure if we want him. I'm sure there had to have been fear on the part of many. Maybe thinking, hey, I, maybe he's infiltrating. Maybe he's working against us and he's trying to get in on the inside and he's co-opting our language. And he's even got a nice guy like Barnabas to use. I'm sure you probably had some of that on the other side. Uh, outside of the church and the larger culture, you probably had people that would say, I can't believe Paul became so exclusive about Jesus Christ. I can't believe that he would forsake the religion of his upbringing in Judaism and, and begin to just embrace Jesus exclusively. How offensive. What an idiot. I can't believe that he would go for that stuff. And so the gospel, in a way, offends people all across the spectrum and maybe causes uh, some sort of consternation, maybe a little bit of doubt and some fear as to its penetration in the hearts of the most unlikely people. And this is happening in Antioch, in the church. And the spirit is moving. And, and people are stirring. The, the gospel has a way of turning people's lives around that defy explanation. And the gospel has a way of Offending the senses of everybody across the spectrum. Creating its own space and place in the hearts of people where they realize that, that all are one in Jesus if they've truly found him. And what Barnabas and Saul, later to be called Paul, represent is the bringing together of those two spectrums. And what happens in the local church as the people are praying before, during, and after their time together is a seedbed, a hotbed of the spirit-directed activity in the hearts of these two guys, but also then uh, uh, just a, a wildfire of people who recognize that, that the Holy Spirit cannot be contained inside our traditional upbringing. That God is going to move in the way he's going to move, when he wants to move, and how he wants to move. The question is, are we moving with him, or are we standing aside and wondering, perhaps in fear or in consternation or in, or in confusion, trying to figure out first what's going on? Well, God was moving in a pretty specific way here in Antioch, and it was uh, becoming uh, something of, uh, uh, pop it was becoming very popular. Yeah, I was just on the phone this week with uh, a friend of mine from Canada that I went to be with about uh, two years ago, uh, my friend Nigel. He, he's out in, um, in Lethbridge in the middle of nowhere, Canada, basically, and he would say that too. And um, when I stayed with him, I, I, I spent the week with a housemate named Henrik, who is uh, a part of a church in Leipzig. And I remember uh, a couple of years ago Henrik telling me that part of the political situation in Germany was that there were hundreds of thousands of refugees walking into Germany. And there was both uh, fear because of the social and, and uh, political chaos in Germany. There was fear of uh, a greater outbreak of terroristic activity, um, which has, has, has come to be in different corners of Europe. But then... Henrik also explained that there was an opportunity uh, for the church to be able to impact hundreds of thousands of Muslims who realized the bankruptcy of Islam in their own country and were leaving that bankrupt area 
coming to a new place and asking the question, what does your Bible have to say about this? And two years removed from those conversations, I talked to my friend from Canada, and he said, you would weep if you saw the Syrian and Iranian converts now in Henrik's church that have been baptized and in droves are reaching out to their fellow uh, countrymen and women. He said, you would weep. The church that he is a part of has grown tremendously. And by the way, there is one person in there that they suspect could be associated with terroristic activity. We don't know it for sure, but they're working on it. And to think that the gospel has this penetrating and life-transforming effect under the hand of God would bring people to a church who otherwise, from where they used to be, would have no reason and perhaps would lose their life for even considering the claims of Christ and now are sitting in a class to learn the German language through the Bible. And as they read the Bible, they ask the question, what does Jesus have to say about this? What does the Bible have to say about that? And here is a convert, Henrik, saying, this is exactly what the Bible has to say to you. And it's beyond racial categories. It's beyond religious divide. It's beyond political categories. It's the need for life change. So as Barnabas and Saul stayed together in Antioch, I'm sure with eyebrows raised, they learned the word of the Lord together from the Old Testament, and they learned the teaching of Jesus, then that begins the New Testament, and he begins to cut his doctrinal teeth there with Barnabas, called Christians now. And what you have with Niger, Simeon, Lucius, Herod the Tetrarch, Saul, all of these different people, is the gospel cutting across all economic categories, all political categories, and all social categories. And as people prayed, the Spirit moved and sent people out. There was, a, there was a movement in the mission while people prayed that, that God was doing. He was sending the most unlikely people into the harvest, carrying out the mission of Jesus. And one of the ways, I think, as a church, if we're ever going to move forward, is that we have to be praying the other six days of the week that God would be doing something in you and in me and in this church so that we might see all different kinds of people come to faith. That's what was happening back then, and that's what we pray to start happening now. The prayer isn't simply, God, please help me to worship more effectively tomorrow. Yes, that's part of it. But number two, it's that what we do here and why we gather, that it would have a greater and more explosive impact on the world around us through the raising up and sending out of people. Don Carson one of my professors in his book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation, says, we do not drift into spiritual life. We do not drift into disciplined prayer. We will not grow unless we plan to pray. In other words, if you don't have a plan, you'll probably not do it. You have a plan for your education. You have a plan for your retirement. You have a plan for your 401K. You have a plan for your career movements. People have plans for everything. But usually the most important thing in their life they don't have a plan for, which is praying and reading the Bible. And I understand that because I realized, too, that there were seasons of time in my life where I didn't have a plan. You're a pastor. Aren't you supposed to have a plan? Yes. I got busy just like you. Oh, you get busy, too? Uh-huh. And, th and the thing is, it's, it's a discipline. It's so difficult to maintain. But the beginning is, is having a plan and then carrying forth with the plan. And so if we plan to come worship, which you're here now, but the, w the way I think to most effectively maximize our time here and then as a group of people is to go out into the world prayerful, to come into our worship prayerful. Secondly then, not only praying, but bringing something, bringing something. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for the building up. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, there are a lot of fun topics about prophecy and speaking in tongues, and we're not going to get into that fun house today. That fun house will be for another time. 
Some of you are chuckling mildly. Some of you had no idea what I'm talking about. Well, let's just put it this way. I'm not totally sure when he's talking about a uh, revelation tongue and an interpretation. Uh, there, there are different ways that people understand those things, and I can't get into all those this morning. But I think over this three-chapter section in 1 Corinthians, what he's doing is he's helping the people figure out how to treat each other inside the local church when they gather together. You, you, when you go to a wedding, weddings, Saturday afternoons, July and August in churches, all the time, 1 Corinthians 14, the greatest of these is love, right? Love is patient, love is kind. Oh, oh, you see the way she was looking at him when they read that passage? Yes. I usually am the closest one to see all that. 1 Corinthians 13, and then into 14, sure, it's about a Saturday afternoon wedding, but it's actually more geared towards Sunday morning worship because it's the way people treated each other to follow in the way of love, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, coming out of 1 Corinthians 13 on love. It's the way people treated each other when they came into the fellowship. That was actually the biggest concern. It, it, it had become a lot of individualized exhibitions of people's spiritual gift. People like to outdo each other. They like to kind of get the focus on them. And you have to really fight against that. But in Corinth, it was just, it was absolute chaos. It wasn't a group of people as a family. It was just a collection of individuals. My concern on Sunday coming together with the people back in Corinth was about me and God, nobody else. Not me and God and you, me and God. So if God gave me a word, a revelation, a tongue, or whatever, I was just going to blah, 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 say it. And then people might look at, oh, wow, look at him. He's really in touch with the Spirit. Maybe he is. Maybe he isn't. But nobody, nobody knew. So what Paul is doing, he's, he's regulating this. He's helping people understand that it's, it's much more concerning that it's happening, in a sense, to the detriment of the whole than the building up. When you come together, the point is to bring something that builds someone else up. Worship isn't your time to, of exhibition. It's not your exclusive time to shut everyone off. It's not the extra added time to your otherwise busy, busy week. It's your time to have a God-glorifying effect on the rest of people by edifying them in both your mind, your words, and your actions. When you come together, you bring something. You come prepared a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, what have you. In other words, is there something that you've learned this week? Is there a lesson? Is there some kind of thing in the Bible that stuck out to you? Is there a song that got your attention? Are you coming ready to sing even these songs? I will tell you that the number one thing that encourages me through a time together here is hearing you sing. If, if you, if you want to give your pastor a pastor appreciation gift. Hearing you sing is the best. It's, it's the absolute best. And I think, you know, I, thi I think we're getting better. I think we can do better, but I think we're getting better. And we're learning a repertoire of songs. Some of you might say, I think we, I feel like we sing some of the same ones. We do on purpose because it probably takes a good decade for a group of people to coalesce around a good song bank and to start drinking them in and learning them in our hearts so that while you're driving, the song comes back to you. And the song is reflective of the truth of Scripture. That it's not a worship song about you and how you feel about God, but it's a song about God, His worth in glory, and how you respond to that. There's a big difference between those two things. But our hope is that as these songs start to resonate in your heart and life, They'll resonate in the words that you speak and perhaps will be a word that you speak to somebody else. I'll, I'll finish here. A couple weeks ago, we had these um, coaches in from uh, all over the place. And we had uh, the young man from Rwanda, who the other one, the, the one was the pastor who spoke on stage and, and prayed. But the other young guy, uh, JC, was uh, was also here, and he's 28 years old. And he spoke a word of encouragement to us after the service that melted us. Uh, it just melted us. And 
as a 28-year-old man who, who has learned English as a second language, who came prepared to respond to God and come to worship to do that was maybe one of the highlights we've had this year uh, as, as a couple. But the thing that has continually struck me in his life is that he spoke those sincere words of encouragement really from no earthly reason if you think about his life. His father died in a genocide when he was five years old. He was a judge. He was shot. He was a well-respected man in the community, and that earned him a bullet in 1994. While he and his mom fled, from their village, she had a baby on her back, and she was seven months pregnant. She gave birth in a camp six weeks after the genocide had ended. And J.C. came to know Jesus through the faithful teaching in a church and is now a converted, joyous, and encouraging man. And, and to to be able to look at his life, it wouldn't make sense if I weren't someone who was following Christ. That just There's just no earthly reason why a person would have that much joy. But if I've come to understand that Jesus is changing radically people from all different nations, cultures, and tribes, and that he can work through the most some of the most horrific circumstances, a million people killed in a hundred days. And yet the gospel is moving through people in the church, in that area, faithfully. And people are coming from over there to this place, speaking words of encouragement, evangelism. And perhaps when we get to glory, the eyes of children are opening because of the travel of one country to another. To think about that. And to think that we have this opportunity together. We come from a difficult week, a hard background, no earthly reason to prepare, to sing, to pray, to do anything. And yet the meager prayers of others are answered in our hearts as we pull it together, as we show up here faithfully, as we talk to each other, we bring a word of encouragement for the building up of the other person. And God starts to expand the mission activity of the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about it. We, we, we've, thought, we've thought through why we come to church and what the church is, but how we prepare it goes a long way in what happens through the other parts of the week. You may not think so, but it's true. It's so true. I think I'm the beneficiary of a lot of people who prepared to pray and went down to Parkside Church in Bainbridge over years and years and years. And at, this, at the right time, God had raised up in the minds of the elders the, uh, the, the idea that a church should be planted. And at the same time, he raised up the idea in our hearts that we should be the ones to go and plant a church. But I think that comes on the strength of years and years of faithful prayer as people prepare to get together. And I think what you and I have the opportunity to do is to pray that same way for not only the present but the future of this church. And that's what becomes so exciting in the local church. That's why you don't have to keep asking yourself the question, why come? You won't want to stay away because God is moving and doing something beyond our comprehension. And that's the privilege we all have to share together, not just me. All of us. All of us. Let me pray, and then we're going to um, enjoy the Lord's Supper together. Father, uh, we think of uh, this incredible spirit-directed activity in the, in, in the early church, and we know it didn't happen by accident. We know it happened according to a plan. But it happened because people were praying. And we pray that you will help us to be a more prayerful and intentional people together. Father, as we come before your table, we pray that you'll give us opportunity now to reflect on our own lives, confessing and repenting of uh, what is in our hearts, 
but joyous as well that we found forgiveness in Jesus. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.